I hear the drums of war pounding. Hitler has been elected Chancellor of Germany. Stalin, Mussolini, Franco are spreading political fear. And I fear that we are going to be at war again. I lived through the Great War. I know the devastation that war can bring. But then, my life has been bracketed by war. I was born during the American Civil War. Not that my family paid much mind to it. We were rich. We weren't just rich, we were very rich. My mother always had a fine wardrobe from Paris every spring. Oh, my maiden name was Edith Newbold Jones. We were the Joneses everyone was keeping up with. That's where the phrase began, with my mother's wardrobe from Paris. For the most part, though, as I said, we didn't pay much attention to the American War. I actually lived in Europe growing up as a child. I learned to speak Italian and German and French before I was five. I came to love the art and the architecture of the old world. I remember as a child having lunch every Sunday, and a kindly old gentleman would come to have lunch with us. And afterwards, I would clamber upon his knee, and he would tell me stories of Greek mythology. What blessings I have heaped upon the head of the teller. Even at the tender age of five, fairy tales left me indifferent, but the domestic tales of the gods of Olympus aroused my childhood wonder. I wanted to make up stories of my own. I called it making up. I would pace the floor and hold a book in my hand. Sometimes it was upside down. It didn't matter. I couldn't read. I would pay, turn the pages and spew forth all sorts of fantastical stories. Even when we moved to Florence and back to Newport in America, I continued my making up. Oh, I, I didn't go to school. I had a governess, Anna Ballman, who fed my mind with a wealth of literature and poetry. My parents' contribution to my education was to ensure that I spoke good, proper English. But you see, to the society in which we belonged, good manners was um, enforceable by having good grammar. And only two things were important to those people, having good manners and having money. My mother used to say the only way not to worry about money was to have quite a lot of it. My father had a fine library, not that he liked to read or anyone else in that society, but I loved to read. My mother wasn't sure how to direct my education, and so she decreed that I should read no modern novels. Thus I was thrown upon Dante and Wordsworth and Shakespeare to arouse my childhood wonder. The only modern novelist I was permitted to read was Washington Irving. But this, despite the disturbing fact that he wrote, he was one of us, as my mother said. But I love to read. It was interesting. These people didn't care about intellectualism in any way. Oh, to sing was a drawing room accomplishment. But to write or to paint was a cross between the black arts and manual labor. But I love to read, and I wanted to write. My first attempt at age 11 was a novel. My mother's icy rejection soon shook me out of that. And I took to writing poetry. But my parents didn't want to encourage me, so they wouldn't buy me any paper. I took to begging for the brown paper wrapped around packages delivered to our back door. My mother, she lived in fear that I was going to be an intellectual. Edith, she said, who was going to marry an intellectual? But despite her worst fears, I made my high society debut and survived the empty gaiety of several seasons and finally decided to marry Teddy Wharton, a friend of my brother's, about 10 years older than I. He had a nice boyish sense of good humor. And my mother approved of him because he was one of us. Teddy and I married and we purchased a house there in Newport, uh, right on the ocean. The views were stunning. But the house itself was quite ugly. So we hired a young architect from Boston, a man named Ogden Codman Jr., to help us renovate both the exterior as well as the interior. Well, this was not done in those days. For in those days, interior design was left entirely to dressmakers, who covered every square inch with festoons of lace and velvet and brocade and gimcracks and gigaws. It was the height of Victoriana. But both Ogden and I detested these excesses. We felt that interiors should be simple and architectural and elegant. And we decided to write a book, which we did, and we called The Decoration of Houses. But how could we get it published? Everyone we went to laughed at us outright. Who would buy a book with such strange ideas from some unknown designers? But 
I had another way to get it published. About a year before we finished that book, I had been at our New York house for the winter, and I had decided I would send three of my poems to three leading magazines. I had no idea how to approach an editor. I simply put the poems in an envelope with my society calling card, no address, just my name, and I sent them off. But all three were accepted. I remember standing in the foyer with my first acceptance letter, not believing that I was a published author. I had to run up and down the steps with the enthusiasm of a 10-year-old child, even though I was a mature woman of 30. <laughs> so one of the editors that published my poems was Scribner's magazine. Edward Burlingame, the editor. He became my best navigator in the land of letters. He asked not only what else I had written and wanted to publish my poems and my short stories. And so I went to Edward and asked if they would publish the Declaration of Houses. Now, it wasn't what they normally published. And so he hesitated, but decided that he wanted to keep my poems and stories coming, and so he agreed to it. I he bought out a small edition, thinking only my friends would buy a gift copy for themselves. But the book sold out, and was reprinted, and reprinted, and then printed in England, and sold out again. And to this day, it continues to be in print and bring a royalty to its astonished authors. You see, everyone was tired of the stuffy trappings of Victorian style. They were wanting a new, modern look. It became the touchstone of taste to use my book in designing your house. So my first success came with the decoration of houses. But my literary career, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. My literary career really began with Scribner's, and they published my poems and my stories. I had that pleasant sensation of seeing my name in print. They just were magazines. They weren't permanent publications. But it was exciting to see one's name in print. But in 1887, something astonishing happened. Scribner's brought out a book of my collected stories. I had written stories worthy of preservation. Was it the same insignificant I that I had always known? Anyone might go to a bookstore and pay money for my books and take them home and read them and share them. I felt as if my soul had taken wings. And I had finally found the, the people with which I wanted to live, the, the country that I could be a part of. My family was not quite as enthusiastic. Neither my immediate family nor my immense tribe of cousins ever mentioned my writing, either to praise or to blame. In fact, they treated it as though it were the family disgrace, and they were quite embarrassed by it. To become a writer, I had to fight my way through a fog of indifference, if not tacit disapproval. It didn't matter. I was now a writer, and I wanted to surround myself with other writers. A friend of mine suggested to my husband that we go to London for a visit, for surely someone there would talk to me about literature. No one in New York would. And so we went to London. When I got there, the first thing I did was go to a bookstore. For I wanted to be able to hold my own in a conversation and be sure that I could talk about what others were talking about. And I asked what people were reading in London these days. He took out a book and handed it to me and said, this is what everyone in London is talking about today. It was my own book. I should like to have followed up that brief glimpse of success. But my husband grew bored in London, and it's depressing to live in the dissatisfied, so we came home to America. But America would change. We sold our house in Newport. I was always tired of watering place trivialities, and we built a house out of the Berkshires that I designed, called the Mount. And the next 10 years would be happily spent there with my gardens and my friends who would come to visit. From a childhood of complete intellectual isolation, I now had most varied and complete mental comradeship. Friends so would come to visit, we would have salons, we would talk into the night of art, and literature, and poetry, and politics. I was also in the first throes of new authorship, so I came out with another collection of short stories and one of poetry in my first novel. But the idea for a novel began to grow in my mind, one of the New York society in which I lived. Now I had a problem. In those days, one could only write about the common man. Anything else was considered unimportant. So here is my challenge. How do I take something as frivolous as New York High Society and find importance? And my answer was the character Lily Bart in the book The House of Mirth. 
and it was an immediate success, ensuring that I was an important writer of my day. It brought me a great deal of money, too, I should say. About this time, about the time the House of Mirth was uh, published, Teddy and I decided we would sell the New York house. We only went there in the winter. And New York winters are depressing. They're harsh and cold. And Teddy began to suffer from serious depression. We decided to take a house in Paris. It's social in Paris and easy to go south for sunshine when one needs it. We rented a, a, a flat for my Vanderbilt cousins in Paris, but soon we rented one of our own. And I would stay in that flat for the next 13 years until after the abyss or devastation brought on by the war. As I look back on those days before the war, I remember such happy, golden memories, as if floating in a bubble. We were quite celebrated in, in Paris for a new uh, translation of the, a French translation of the House of Mirth had just come out. And in Paris, one lives for literature, unlike New York. And I was quite famous and well received. I had so many friends. It was like a joyful time that we look back upon. We had no idea the war was coming. I remember a garden party in June of 1914. A shadow fell across our assembled group. Have you heard the news? Sarajevo. The Archduke Ferdinand and his wife, both dead. A momentary shiver went through us all, and one or two shook their heads and murmured of Austrian reprisals. But to most of, most of us, the Archduke was a man we didn't know, and Sarajevo, a place we'd never been. This little talk soon moved on to the latest play and the newest exhibition. I had plans of my own that summer. I was going to, to go to England, just live near my friend Henry James, and do some writing. But first, I was taking a trip to Spain. Oh, the Spanish trip was lovely. The days were hot, and new roads lured us on. But as we approached the French border on our way home, we began to hear disquieting news. It can't be war, we said. That night, we slept in a hotel in Poitiers. And all night long, young men sat out in the street, singing the Marseillaise, the French national anthem. Can't be war. We hurried back to Paris, where the air was thick with rumors. And two days later, war was declared. When I am told by people who were not yet born, or were still in the nursery in that fateful year of 1914, that France and England went happily to war, or worse, that France and England forced war on a peace-loving Europe, I am indignant. Let me set the record straight for future generations. France and England never wanted war. Yes, the Allies made mistakes. I will admit to that. But those mistakes came in 1919 with the Treaty of Versailles. But to those who love peace and beauty, they can never love war. But once war is declared, they met the challenge with a collective white glow of dedication. Once war was declared, Paris became virtually empty. Deserted streets and shuttered houses. The men were taken away to the front almost immediately. Every vehicle, every bus, every taxi cab was gathered up. The front was close enough to Paris that men were delivered to their units by taxi cab. And with the men gone, Paris was deserted. And the women had no means of support. The government gave a, a meager allowance to soldiers, but nothing, not enough to raise a family. Many of my friends began what was called workrooms for women, where women could sew for the war effort and uh, help to support their families and earn an honorable income. Some friends encouraged me to do the same. Now, I have never done anything like this in my life. But in war, there is enough misery for every task to find a hand to do it. And so I, be I tried to start a workroom. Now, because I was American, all my funds had been frozen from the banks. I had no money of my own. I went and gathered about 12,000 francs from the few friends, that I had, friends I had left in Paris. And I began a workroom. I hired a woman and hired 90 women to sew. Mine was a little different from other people's workrooms, but I wanted to not compete with my friends. Once it was up and running, I was satisfied. Now, most of us thought the war would last six weeks at most. And so I decided to go on to England, as I'd already sent my household staff ahead and had no way to pay them. So I went back to, on to England to visit uh, my friend Henry James. But once I was there, I realized the war was not ending soon. All of my friends said, Edith, Edith, stay here in England, away from the war zone. The war is going to last a long time, and there's so much destruction. But I had to get back. 
I paid my bills, took care of my staff, and went to London to try to find a pass across the channel. I went from office to office. Finally, an overworked official at the American Embassy said that he could give me a pass if I had a passport, a photo take, and this was before the days of passports, actually. And so he gave me the address to a photographer, and I went and knocked on the door. He looked at me strangely, but he led me around back and up a rickety ladder to the flat shed of a roof. It was strange, but everything was strange in those days. Then he said, Madam, I must confess, I have never taken a photograph of a human being before, only wild animals. <laughs> well, his photograph was testimony to his art. I looked like a hyena deprived of her young. But it was enough to get me across the channel. Once back in Paris, I found that the woman running my workroom had fled in fear of the advancing German army and taken all the money with her. The workroom was in shambles. I vowed I would never again let that happen. I would never leave it unattended. Something else, though, the German army, the advancing German army, sent to Paris. Thousands and thousands of Belgian refugees. Their faces were unforgettable. They arrived dazed and stunned, clutching a sorted bundle in one hand and a child by another. These were not people who could look to return to their homes when the war was over. Their homes had, homes had been obliterated by the German army. They'd been plowing and planting and spinning and weaving when a great cloud of fire and blood had descended upon their homes. And now here they were, in a strange country. A foreign language spoke all about them, and only memories of burnt homes and murdered children. Things no eye should see. These are the people who stand by the hundreds under makeshift shelters trying to stay out of the rain, waiting for, in exchange for all that makes life sweet, a blanket or a pair of shoes. The Red Cross was involved with the immense task of military hospitals, and the French government could not handle all the refugees. Friends of mine began to create refugee agencies and encouraged me to make an American one. Again, I had no idea where to begin, but I plunged in and created American Hospitals for Refugees. My biggest challenge was knowing which volunteers I could trust. Some would come and look vague and half interested, and they would be my best volunteers. Others would show up and tell me exactly what I was doing wrong, what they would do, and then never see them again. To be sure, we worked hard. Nine o'clock every morning to well after midnight or one in the morning, seven days a week. I had to have an able lieutenant. My skill was raising money. That's what I needed to do for this agency. I had to find someone to run the agency for me. One day, a woman showed up. I knew her. She was an acquaintance. Her name was Elisita Tyler. She said simply, my husband and I want to help. Elisita took a tottering house of cards and made a solid one of bricks and mortar and foundation. Never did her energy fail, never did she disappoint me, never did we argue. And in 1918, when the war was over, our agency had found homes for 9,000 Belgian refugees. We had created, we had served 250,000 hot meals, built eight hospitals, and given jobs to 900 women. Let me tell you, that amount of work takes a great deal of money. And I want to say right now that I've never forget my friends, forgotten my friends in America who has helped to raise money. All throughout America, Edith Wharton societies were formed to help raise money for these Belgian refugees. And I've never forgotten the help I've got. Of course, I did my part to raise money as well. One of my more successful attempts was editing a book I called The Book of the Homeless. It was essays and paintings by what European artists. My friend, Henry James, was featured. And my good friend Theodore Roosevelt wrote the introduction. But in 1915, another way to make some money appeared. The French Red Cross asked me if I would go to the front and write articles that would be published in America. They had convinced the generals that if I could write these articles, America would join the war. Now, the French government had decreed that no foreign journalists were permitted to go to the front. But they would make an exception for me. And so I began a series of six expeditions to the, to the front lines. I shall never forget riding into a camp, either in my car or astride a mule, laid with cigarettes and bandages. The young men with whom I shared jokes and cigarettes and food, the burden of messages they gave me to take home to their families. The war-torn countryside, the trenches, 
rat haunted and deep with mud and grime in the faces of the men who held those trenches. My first uh, trip to the front was uh, February 1915. We were driving down the road and a young lay agent of the general stopped us and said that we could go no further. Then he came back and said, are you the lady who wrote the book, The House of Mirth? Oh, you could go. <laughs> but drive fast, he said, for we don't want civilians on the road that day. It was the day the French took the heights of Aqua on the road to Verdun. A successful day, an important strategic win for the, the French to eventually win that battle. But at what cost? If all the men who died at Verdun stood up, there wouldn't be room for them to stand on the battlefield. I watched the battle myself, from behind a cottage garden, watching through field glasses. The burning of the woods, the rap of the guns, the young men racing in the fire-tongued woods, and the wounded, thousands and thousands brought to that small village. But I had a mission of my own. The next day, we went on to Verdun itself. There was no civilians there. It just was one hospital after another. We delivered a few supplies, as we were told to do, but our mission was to go to the second-line hospitals. If the front is the first line, the hospital right behind the trench is the second. Young men brought directly from the trench to these hospitals, and we were there to deliver the supplies. I saw such instances of bravery. Men carried in, wearing uniforms they had not taken off for three or four months, encrusted with mud, hardened with their own blood, their feet rotting away from standing in that vile water at the bottom of the trenches. Doctors and nurses working 18, 20 hours a day, I saw such instances of bravery. One in particular, a young man had his head bandaged. And the doctor said gently, you can go back to the front tomorrow or maybe the next day. And he looked surprised and said, but I'm going back now, and turned and went to the trench. We turned to going the other way, our mission accomplished. But we ran into unexpected difficulty, for there was no way to know where you were going. The Germans had so obliterated the countryside there were no roads, there were no street signs, just black holes that had once been houses, long chasms that had once been streets. It was like a vast moonscape, just 60 miles out of Paris. We wandered for days, not able to find our way, and eventually made it back. Another time I went to the front on the furthermost southern part. The, the trenches stretched 450 miles from the Swiss border up to the channel. We went down to the furthermost southern part. A young Dragoon was given to be our guide, and we drove as far as we could, and then took off on foot. A few ways up, we stopped at a platform and looked out into the valley below. On one side was the German line, and the other were the French. And in between lay no man's land, a land desolate with hate, saturated with evil. And as we watched, the guns began to explode. The French 75s firing on the Germans, and then returning fire. Now there is a majesty in distant cannons as you watch a battle from afar, but these guns at my feet sounded like all the hounds of hell straining at their leashes. We quickly retreated and continued to clamber up the hillside, and soon the skirmish died out. We came to a well-protected opening in the trench and dropped inside. There was now lattice work, keeping our feet above the vile water that gathered at the bottom of the trench, and wood supporting the side so it wouldn't crumble in and trees overhead giving everything a greenish light. As we clambered down the mountain, zigzagging our way, we would pass young dragoons on shelves, a shelf carved out to look out at no man's land. They would speak to us, but never so much as turn their cheek, never taking their eyes off that land. And down we climbed through fortified doorways, and finally we came to one very large doorway, fortified with iron and steel, I realized we were on the extreme verge of the defenses. We pushed our way into what had been an old abandoned farmhouse. The walls were still there, but nothing else remained. Dragoons sat on what was left of the second floor, and men scattered about doing what they do in camps, darning their socks or writing a letter, playing cards. But these men were doing it as if we're on a deathbed, for they just whispered. As I looked between a crack in the wall, I saw another farmhouse not far away. But these watchers wore helmets of a different shape. Suddenly I was overwhelmed. Why didn't one bomb from the enemy completely annihilate us all? And then I realized thousands and thousands.
thousands of eyes staring from here in Lorraine all the way up to the channel, 450 miles, lest their one small part of that trench be breached. You see in their eyes, even when they're accepting a cigarette or telling a joke, that look is there, the look that says at any moment they might die for their country. As we clambered back up the hill and made our way to our car, I realized the men on the near side of no man's land had been made by this war. And the men on the far side had, been, had made the war. Back in Paris, a city of deserted streets, the news of the war rolled on. We weren't winning, but we weren't losing. The, the enemy ever there, thousands and thousands of dead, listed every day, heartache and grief, one after another. I only had one respite from the work of the war, and that was in 1917, when the governor of Morocco invited me to visit that country and attend a business exhibition in Rabat. And then he extended his visit to stay, stay for three weeks and travel to Morocco. And so I did. From Rabat to Mogador to Marrakesh. I traveled on old caravan roads and through the desert. I visited ancient walled cities and saw small hidden gardens with plaster lacework and sparkling flat fountains. We witnessed religious um, ceremonies never before seen by Westerners. To touch the past with one's hands is only realized in dreams. And that dream rat like quality followed us throughout our visit to Morocco. Now, Morocco was not a part of the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Empire. And so when the dreadful Sykes Pico Agreement was enacted, it was not affected. Oh, yes, Turkey was an ally of Germany. And when they fell, the, the, the Western countries divided up the Middle East. They simply took a straight line and made countries like Iraq and Lebanon and Syria and Jordan without paying any attention to tribal or clan distinctions or geographical distinctions. The Arabs were furious. They had been our allies against the Turks. They had rose up and fought against the Turks on our behalf and we had made promises to them and those promises were not kept. There are many far wiser than me that say the Arab nations will prove a formidable ally for the Western world in years to come. But that was long before my visit to Morocco. And as I said, Morocco was not affected by that dreadful agreement. My visit to Morocco was like a burst of sunlight through dark clouds on a winter day. Eventually, though, I returned to Paris and couldn't write up my experience in Morocco until a few years later. We went back to the grueling and unenduring war work that we had. When you see a friend in the street, you stop them and say, your son at the front? The son at the front. This new world has given us a new language. Words like front, trench, and wire now mean something completely different than they did five years ago. And usually words weren't even necessary. You would see their despair in their eyes and you would know without being told. It is amazing to me at how we endure the unendurable. We began to ask ourselves, for whom is this war being fought? For the old men sitting at cafes with a specter of death between them? For mothers disfigured by grief? And barely a child left by any of these, these soldiers to carry on the, the faith for which they died? And still the war. Still we heard more casualties, a thousand here, a hundred thousand there, a million die at the Battle of the Somme. A million men in one battle. When would it end? But through it all, through it all there was hope. Yes, there was hope. For despite the heartache, the victory of Verdun had proven the inexhaustible strength of the French. Other countries had joined our side, England, and others to join with us, and maybe just Maybe America would join the war. When the Lusitania was sunk in 1915, we thought certainly America would join us then. But the Germans promised to restrict their submarine warfare, and Wilson waited. But early in 1917, the Germans lifted that restriction and began to torpedo any ship on the ocean. And then the duplicity of the Zimmerman telegram was revealed, where Germany offered to Mexico to start a war with America, and if when they won, they would be given Arizona, Texas, and New Mexico. Finally, America entered the war. 
was dancing in the streets that day. America had joined our side. Now the war might truly end. I will never forget when the first American troops marched into Paris. They were American Negro troops, and they were playing a new kind of music in a syncopated style. <laughs> we realized they were playing the Marseillaise, our own national anthem, in a new jazz style. Let me tell you, jazz music has conquered France the way no German army ever could. But even with the Americans, the Germans seemed unstoppable. The following winter, 1918, the Germans marched 40 miles within one day and came with a day's march of Paris. 40 miles. Let me put this in perspective to you. The Battle of the Somme took six months to fight. A million men were killed, 600,000 English and 400,000 Germans. And at the end of six months, the victory was measured by a gain of seven miles. For them to march 40 miles in one day was unheard of. One thing stopped them. Those American Negro troops, they're the ones who saved the town of Paris that day. But the war was beginning to change. It was the following summer, I was doing some work in my home with Elisina's husband, Royal. We were working on paperwork, and the sound drew us to the balcony. That those of us living in Paris were inured to the sound of war and bombs dropping all the time. I lived just a block from the ministry. But this was the sound of distant cannons, such as I had heard on my expeditions. Royal turned to me, his face shining. It is General Foch's great offensive, he said, the great French General Foch. And a few months later, in November of 1918, another sound drew me to my balcony. It was the bell ringing in my parish church. And another ring. And another. And soon all the bells of Paris were ringing. Could it be? We had lived so long on the thin diet of hope. But soon our hearts swelled to bursting with the bells. The war, the war was over. And a few months after that, the following summer, I sat on yet another balcony, that of a friend's, and watched the victorious army march down the Champs de la through the Arc de Triomphe. The generals resplendent in their uniforms, the tanks and the guns glittering in the summer sun. But I had seen those same tanks and those same guns on the battlefield encrusted with blood and spattered with the blood of our young men. And tears blurred my eyes and the two visions merged together. At first we thought that our life would go back to the life we had lived before the war. It's good that we had that illusion. Once the joy of victory had passed, the immense grief and loss and waste set in upon us. Thirty-one million men killed or wounded. An entire generation obliterated. Not a house left unscathed. But I was of the age where I grieved for these young men that many of my own friends began to make that journey. Henry James and Anna Baldwin, my two brothers. I just wanted to forget the world I was living in. I wanted to live in the world I had lived in before the war. And so I threw myself into writing a book about my New York childhood. I showed it to my friend Walter Berry, who laughed and said, it's a good book, Edith, but no one will read it but you and I. <laughs> For once, Walter was wrong. The Age of Innocence was quite popular, and I won the Pulitzer Prize for it in 1921. The first woman to receive the award for literature, I should say. But that book, world I wrote about in that book is gone today. Today, we live in an angry, somber world. I listened with dread to Hitler's propaganda on the water list. He's all angry screams and accusations of cowardice to anyone who loves peace and beauty. 20 years ago, General Foch, when he read the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, he said, this is not a treaty. This is a blueprint for a war 20 years to come. And he was right. War is going to be upon us again. We have danced on the growling volcano too long. We all know it will erupt at any moment. But while our days are sad, I think it's possible to find joy in our individual lives. I take great pleasure in the books that I read. I, I hope to write. I, I still love to travel. I love my little dogs and all my friends and my beautiful gardens. I wonder what people mean 
and they say they find emptiness in this great experience of life, which to me is like a horizon-wide sunset, piling up the glories, the glories as light fades. I'm afraid I'm incorrigible. Despite the sadness that I have seen, I still love life, and I love wonder, and I love adventure. Any question you might have, please keep in mind it is 1933. And you're just kind of funny, but I'm too polite to mention that. <clears throat> any and then we can come forward in time and answer some more contemporary questions. But any questions you might have? Yes, ma'am, you got When you first started writing and requested publication, were there other women writers out there? There were other w women writers. Uh, there were more men, certainly, that were women. Uh, there were but there were certainly other women writers. Certainly, uh, Louise May Alcott was writing in those days. I'm trying to think. Uh, there was May Sarton. There were other women writers. Uh, the one difference with me is that all of those writers were forced to kowtow to the um, censorship of the day. You couldn't write about an unlawful alliance out of wedlock. You couldn't write, write about a child who was not born to married parents. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you couldn't write about uh, alcohol or drinking or even religion. And I felt that I didn't need to have the work. I had money. I had my father's trust fund that I lived off. And I owed it to my less lucky colleagues to write about whatever I wanted so we could write about the authentic experiences of the day. In my day, I was considered the one who pushed the edges of, um, of the, the arts. And became, that's what, why I became one of the more famous writers. But there were other women. Yes, uh, You mentioned that you were related to the Vanderbilts? Yes, those were my cousins. We were, uh, you know, Mrs. Van, my cousin Mrs. Vanderbilt one time was heard to say that there were only 400 people who were of proper New York society. No one knew who the 400 were, but it became a catchphrase for the 400. And we were certainly, the Joneses were certainly among them. Yeah, you said um, that a woman, I, I, I don't remember the name, but a woman stole everything from your factory. And she, she, she was afraid of the advantage. The Germans were kept threatening Paris. And had they to overrun Paris, there would have been havoc and mayhem, and they raped without discrimination. They, they, she was frightened, and so she left, and she took the money with her. It wasn't that she stole it. Right, right, okay. I, you know, I, but she did leave me in lurch. <laughs> well, now, and who was this woman? Well, like, was she? She, but let me, let me explain something else. I mentioned this, I dropped in there, that my factory was a little different than other factories. I didn't want to compete with my friends. My friends were all sewing for the war effort. They were making bandages and soldiers' uniforms, and I didn't want someone to have to undercut price and try to compete. And so I thought, well, what can I do that is different from what these people are making? And I knew that in America, they still wanted French lingerie. So I hired lace makers, and we made French lingerie, and those poet shirts, those big pillowy poet shirts that men wear, and we would send them to America to sell them so we could have our money. So I had hired a lace maker as my, um, as my overseer for my family. And I even when I was on in one of my expeditions, I stopped at a nunnery that was well known for lace and got some special patterns as well. But I didn't want to compete with my friends. So I thought it was pretty creative, wasn't it? <laughs> because again, the other problem is the Belgium are, no, are known, the, uh, in Flanders, they're known for lace making. These were the displaced women. And they needed to be able to, A, find work that they could do to support themselves, but find work that gave them some sense of normalcy in their life. By making lace, I provided a chance for these women to, to fight the, 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 the traumas of war. Any other questions? Well, let's come forward in time. I guess you know I'm not really Edith Warden. Did I fool you? What? All right, so let me tell you about Edith Wharton and, and um, a little bit about this time period. Edith Wharton dies just a couple of years after this presentation. She dies in 1937. And she's, um, she is probably the most important writer of the American 20th century. She really creates the genre of American realism. And I kind of gave a little hint of that with, with the one who asked the question, is that she did, wasn't um, held back by the, by the confines of the, of the day. For example, um, she has a meeting one time with uh, Thomas Hardy, who wrote Judy Obscure and Tessa the Obervilles. And uh, he told her that he originally planned for those two children and Judy Obscure to be um, 
illegitimate, and they, they had to be orphans. They, they weren't allowed to, to change his work. And so, um, but she, because she did that, she really becomes a forerunner for the era, genre of realism. She's also really known for her ironic twist at the end, paves the way for people like O. Henry. Uh, by the 30s, she's considered to be old and stodgy, but had she not written what she had written, people like Hemingway and Faulkner could never have written what they had written. In fact, as John Fitzgerald comes to visit her one day, he has to get quite drunk to see her because he's intimidated by her. He comes to see her, and he bases The Great Gatsby on her book, Glimpses of the Moon. So, um, so she really is considered to be one of the most important writers of the 20th century. It's appalling to me that she's so forgotten. When I chose this character, I thought, well, this is a character everyone will know. But um, in my day, we all had to read Ethan Frome in school. <laughs> you know, but uh, have you read Ethan Frome? Or, okay, Age of Innocence. Um, Age of Innocence is her most famous. I don't think, it's not my favorite of hers. I love House of Mirth. It is really, it's quite good. But um, she was really a force to be reckoned with. You know, she really was. Um, one question nobody asked me was about her husband. What happened to her husband? No, he did not die. Her husband? Um, she divorces him in 1913, and I specifically leave that as a question. Most people say, well, was your husband with you on all these trips? Um, Teddy Wharton was 10 years older than her, and when he married her, you know, he, they weren't really in love. They were just sort of good friends, and they have, they have a pretty good relationship, and they do a lot together, they, um, but uh, they don't have much of a romantic relationship. Uh, they don't have, ever have kids. They, you know, they, don't, you know, they have separate bedrooms even. I won't get into that, these details. But Teddy Wharton suffers from manic depression. And in 1913, they didn't have lithium. They didn't have anything to give someone to, to control men's depression. And he is a pretty serious case of it. In fact, his father was hospitalized, institutionalized, and committed suicide from manic depression. So by about 1910, he is, he's violent. His manic moods are, are, are really extreme. Her friends are frightened for her safety. And at some point, they begin to realize he needs to be institutionalized or cared for. And his primary job is taking care of the moms, their house in, in the Berkshires, and that's why they sell that. And at one point, um, he stays in Massachusetts with his family, and they're going to put him in an institution. And he just goes back to France. And about that time, they found out that he had been stealing from her trust fund, because of course, he was the executor of her trust fund, to pay for showgirls that he was keeping in the house. So, um, so yeah, so um, so the family let her divorce him, but she is, when his mother died, they reimbursed her all the money he had stolen from her, and so she divorces him in 1913. And um, as I say, sometimes, you know, the monologue, I, I, did, I was really focusing on World War I for this monologue. I had to get some of the early exposition for it, but I was really focusing on the war. Sometimes I do more with her writing and more with Teddy, and so I would say, you know, I, I looked at 1914 as a year of such hope, you know, the year the war starts. So, um, so she does not say Mary. She does have um, this Walter Berry, her friend of hers. He had been a, a suitor of hers before she married Teddy, but he didn't meet her mother's approval because he wasn't rich enough. He becomes an international lawyer and becomes quite rich. But they, they stay really good friends. Um, he has, you know, he does have women friends that he takes out, but for the most part, Edith is his closest, dearest friend. They never have any kind of romance, but uh, she says when he died, but the love of my life has died. And they are buried next to each other in the Versailles Cemetery. And by the way, she is buried with full military, French military honors. She receives all kinds of honors from the French government for her work. They said that she's, her work writing is what brought the Americans into the war, actually. So um, she you know, is very important in France and, and buried in Versailles. Some other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you.